From the home studios of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, this is Teach Lab, a podcast about the art and craft of teaching. I'm Justin Reich. Today, Craig Watkins, he's a professor at the University of Texas, Austin, and someone who thinks deeply about youth and media and entrepreneurship and hustle. Um, Craig, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Justin. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, as a way of getting to know you and your work a little bit, um, do you have kind of a media story or an ed tech story? Like, what's some part of your journey um, that that brought you into these topics as an area of focus and interest? Yeah, I would say that um, you know one of the things that really sort of drew me into this um, work was um, just you know conversations uh, that I had the fortunate opportunity to have with young Black and Latinx uh, students, uh, middle school, high school. Uh, this is this was many years ago, but but was invited um, into a technology classroom uh, by a, a colleague who was who was teaching in, in, in high school at the time. This is like a computer lab. We should envision like a bunch of desktop computers yeah. a horseshoe at the edge of the classroom and they're like teaching PowerPoint or, or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Something like that. And, um, you know, the, the teacher was really excited about what, what they were doing in the classroom and they were introducing uh, you know, all kinds of software that allow students to, to, to create and tell their own stories through games, through digital, um, you know, animation and art. Um, but but and I was excited to, to 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 visit. But when I got there, you know, I was struck by um, the the lack of creativity in which this this technology, which could afford so much creativity, the lack of creativity in terms of the design of the curriculum and and what it is the students were um, sort of uh, encouraged to do uh, and permitted to do in the context of the classroom. And, and we did something else that was sort of interesting, right? We, we also were invited to just to sort of, you know, interact with the students after school um, when they were kind of, when things were more informal. Um, the, the sort of takeaway from me, right, was that what the students were doing in the more informal setting with the technology was far more creative and interesting uh, than what they were doing in the formal classroom setting. It's where they had the support of adults, where someone supposedly had taken a bunch of time to build a curriculum and could buy additional software and all of that kind of stuff. Still, like the kids hanging out, you know, on the steps of the library after class are doing things that they weren't doing, you know, or doing more interesting things than what they were doing inside the computer lab. Absolutely. Just, I mean, d doing way more interesting things, creative problem solving, um, you know, collaborating together, uh, sharing ideas, techniques. Um, it was just really fascinating to see the, see the differences. And it just really sort of inspired, um, you know, some research that I would do later on, which led to, you know, some of the books that I've written, like The Digital Edge and Don't Like the Hustle. But it was really kind of the, the, the story of both the, the, the affordances and the limitations of technology in the educational setting and why it's so important to design opportunities for young people to, to really explore and ask important and creative questions that allow them to really cultivate uh, their aspirations in meaningful ways. So in my work, a theme that I consistently come back to is this idea that all kinds of education technology evangelists describe technology as particularly good for disadvantaged populations in one form or another. You know, these terms like technology will democratize education. Um, there's a great photo in Larry Cuban's book, Teachers and Machines, where there's a bunch of kids huddled around a radio receiver in the early 20th century. You know, one of these radio receivers is like the size of a small girl. Um, and the caption is, with radio, the underprivileged school becomes the privileged one. You know, that sort of el elites are going to broadcast the best teaching through radio and radio is going to democratize education, um, which we all know didn't happen. So, you know, in my work, I said, try to point out to folks um, in lots of settings, when you distribute technology, it disproportionately benefits the affluent. Um, you, people, you know, um, to, to take advantage even of free new tools requires a certain amount of social, financial, and technical capital. Um, you've, got, you've got to have stuff to be able to use stuff more effectively. Um, but so much of your research, in it, I, I feel like, pushes back against that in creative and important ways and says, no, no, no. Um, people from all kinds of backgrounds, you know, the Black Latinx kids that you were hanging out with at high school, um, are getting access to technology even when they think we're, they're, 
that w- even when we're not, you know, even when we think that they're not, um, and they're doing really interesting things with it, even if it's not happening in classrooms, you know, as you hear arguments about digital divides and those kinds of things, like how do you reconcile your research um, with the sort of line of arguments that like we should be really cautious about people who are saying that technology is going to be particularly good for the least well-served students in our society? Yeah, and I think I think you make some very powerful um, observations there, and uh, and and I would I would agree with you in terms of the the limitations of the the, the technology as sort of democratizing uh, schooling and learning. Um, we're obviously learning that 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 the issue is far more complicated than that, um, and so it, it necessitates right some really interesting and diverse sort of thinking and approaches. Um, you know, but what I found just from the work, that, the, the sort of ethnographic work that we did, right, work in classrooms, work in schools, work in homes, work in all of the kinds of spaces where young Black and Latinx kids, for example, are, are, are hanging out, as well as, as, as others as well. And by ethnographic, you mean hanging out with these kids, hanging out with their families, watching them for sometimes long periods of time, yeah. you know, multiple days over weeks, that kind of thing. We were basically embedded in a, in, a, in a school and in a community for about a year and a half. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, every day for, you know, five days a week for a year and a half, um, you know, we were, we had opportunities to sort of just get close and in depth with students, with teachers, classroom, out of classroom, meeting parents, meeting kids in the homes, meeting parents in the home. And so it was just a, um, it was just a, a really in-depth and detailed uh, kind of exposure uh, to the world and experiences uh, that they encounter in, in their day-to-day lives. Um, you know what? 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 What struck me is even as I came into the project, aware of these ideas around the digital divide and, and the tech rich and the tech poor, the haves and the have-nots. Um, you know, we we when we subscribe to that view with with no other considerations and in a very one-dimensional way, we end up imposing a kind of deficit narrative on, on those who we see as occupying the wrong side yep. of the divide. Um, and that is to say, we only see them right through lack, lack of access to technology, um, lack of um, you know, educational opportunities, um, lack of interest, lack of motivation, lack of this kind of capital, that kind of capital. And, and what I began to discover in my research, right, is that what we haven't devoted an equal amount of attention to are, are the assets that these populations bring to their engagement with technology, ingenuity, creativity, motivation, aspiration. Um, and their own forms of capital, which are just as important, um, you know, as, as other forms of capital, the social capital that they cultivate, the sort of human and intellectual uh, capital that they cultivate that allow them to do some really interesting things with technology. If that's telling stories, if that's building community, uh, if that's inspiring, you know, movements like Black Lives Matter or just sort of reimagining, you know, what, um, you know, what a platform like, 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 like Twitter could be used for, right? So the, so the, the emergence of Black Twitter in all of its sort of uh, you know many forms and manifestations, all of these I think are illustrations of the kinds of assets and ingenuity that populations that we have historically written out of the tech narrative of the ways in which, in some ways, they've actually driven and shaped at the narratives that we've come to understand today. So, like one example from your work is the adoption of mobile broadband. Um, you know, I think that's part of what the digital edge was about that, like, you know, young black creators who were defined at the time in some ways as people who lacked computers, lacked technology access were some of the earliest folks to be participating in the mobile internet. Is that, you know, and, and tell, tell us about what, how that happened and what kind of practices you saw with those young people. Yeah. You know, that was something that, um, we didn't necessarily anticipate when we started doing the, doing the field, field work that, you know, the field research. Um, and it's been kind of consistent since around, I would say, 2009, 2010, 2011, where you begin to see these trends developing. So, so whereas, let's say, for example, kids growing up in lower income households, disproportionately black, disproportionately Latinx, whereas they didn't have access to, you know, desktop computers or laptop computers and, and broadband at, at the home or in the home, they were increasingly getting access via, via mobile phones and, 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 and smart devices, um, smartphones. Uh, and so in some ways they were, they were beginning to become kind of early adopters of the ways in which social media was becoming more and more sort of intertwined with, with, with mobile media. And so if you look at the data over the last 10 to 12 years or so, you know, African-American uh, youth, for instance, um, where, where some of the earliest adopters of Twitter, when you look at 
the, the trends amongst teens and young adults, they were the earliest adopters. They were also some of the more inventive adopters of the technology in terms of fashioning a culture, a language, a communication, just a mode of being in the social and mobile space that has come to define the, the, the culture more broadly. And that was something that was kind of happening under the radar, right? It was happening even as we were writing them out of the digital and tech narrative, um, insofar as we've, we've only sort of understood these spaces as primarily white, male, higher educated and affluent. Um, instead, right, what you see from the bottom up, right, is a very different approach, a very different model, a very different sort of community of, of creators and storytellers and early adopters that in some ways, right, forced me, and I hope through my work, you know, invites others to maybe understand um, the digital divide through a very different lens. Are, are there particular young people from that research that you feel like really capture the essence of what you're describing there? Yeah, so we would be doing like, you know, uh, interviews with with sometimes focus groups, sometimes one on one interviews with, um, with let's say, black or Latinx teens. And this this would have been around 2009, 2010, maybe even a, a little earlier. Um, but they they frequently had like a, a, a mobile phone with them. And they were oftentimes able to just show us, right, interesting things that they were doing, let's say, for example, uh, with Twitter, or interesting things that they were doing, you know, maybe with, with, with some other with, with, with some other social channel. But, but what was clear, right, is that, is that they understood well before many others did that this was a tool, this was a platform in which they could build community. This is a platform or a tool in which they could connect to others who had a similar worldview or a similar world experience as them. Um, and so in that sense, it allowed them right, to imagine, reimagine themselves, reimagine the community that they were a part of in ways that I think were very empowering, in ways that were aspirational, that led to just a lot of different forms of creativity, right? Creativity in terms of storytelling. Creativity, let's say, for example, if, if they were sort of invested in hip hop culture, uh, some aspect of hip hop culture, fashion, writing, design, that they were sort of figuring out ways in which they could connect to others to sort of pursue those aspirations and cultivate those interests in a way um, that that more traditional institutions in their lives simply weren't uh, unable to do, uh, for example, school. Yeah, because their technology teacher, for whatever reason, is like forced to teach them, you know, how to use Microsoft Excel or something like that in that computer class, as opposed to all of the cool things. Yeah, you make a PowerPoint or, you know, you know create something that, that, that has very little sort of aspirational value to it and rather, you know, is, is sort of stripped down and, and mechanical and, yeah. and open academic in ways that, that undermine the sort of creativity uh, that young people oftentimes bring to their engagement with technology, which certainly I think has academic value uh, once we can realize and design opportunities for that academic value to e emerge out of the creative and inventiveness that they bring uh, to their engagement with technology. So, so I, I hear you making this compelling argument for, you know, let's celebrate the ingenuity and youth, uh, uh, the ingenuity, let's celebrate the ingenuity and resilience of youth. Let's make sure we write students into these stories that we're telling, because we're going to get richer narratives and we're going to see, you know, as you say, from the bottom up, um, how different kinds of cultural technological practices emerge. Um, how, how do you use these same ideas or where do you see them becoming relevant now during the pandemic? Um, so like, you know, as I, as I look across the country at the pandemic, one of the main things that I observe is that school systems want to offer online schooling to their students. And there are millions of children who cannot participate in those systems. Um, I was interviewed by a reporter um, at the Arizona Republic who is doing a story about the fact that the Bureau of Indian Education, which has schools for like 60,000 kids, it just didn't buy computers for those 60,000 students who live in these um, you know, highly COVID impacted reservations and neighborhoods with very weak technology. You know, like if there's going to be school, technology is going to play a vital role. And they didn't put in their orders until September. And now these computers are not going to arrive until December or January. You know, schools started late, things like that. And so part, you know, part of me wants to kind of shout to the world. Um, if if we don't 
build an infrastructure for young people that includes all the tools for them to be able to learn in a future that's going to have more pandemics, more shutdowns from climate change, um, then these kids are going to miss really important parts of their education. Um, but embedded within that argument, it, it, you know, I, like it seems like that, that argument seems important to me, but it seems to fall prey to exactly what you're saying, which is it's not really hearing from the you know young Native American kids in these communities what they're thinking and it doesn't necessarily provide enough room to say like well what practices are they learning how are they figuring out how to do schooling or or participating I don't know as you hear as you hear these kinds of conversations during the pandemic um, how do you hope people will bring you know your ideas and research like into this particular crisis yeah that's a, that's a really great question. Um... You know, what are the takeaways from the research that we did for the digital edge? And, and I think others have come to a similar conclusion. Is that I think we're at a point, I mean, so uh, notwithstanding, right, the example that you just gave, right, where this is an extreme instance of kids literally not having access, right, to, to the technology that they need in order to participate in, in remote, remote learning. Um, but, but what we've seen over the last 20 years or so, right, is, is actually, uh, I think, a, a, a contrasting trend. And that is more and more tech coming into the schools. And you talk about this in your book, right? Mm -hmm. Tech coming into the schools. Um, th there's almost been like an arms race, right? To get computers into the school, to get internet into the schools, to get tablets into the schools, smart boards, you name it. Um, and, and all of those things in the pandemic, those, I mean, if you think about them as a supply chain, those supply chains are now being extended into the homes. Right. So, you know, it used to be in most schools, we said, let's get this stuff into the building and right. we'll let people use it in a temporary way. Now, you know, now Boston has to find 55,000 machines that they can put into 45,000 households across the city of Boston with hotspots and internet connection, all these kinds of things. Right. It's a huge extension of that. Yeah, it's uh, exactly. And so, so there's a new kind of arms race happening as a, as a result of, of, the, of, the, of the pandemic. But, but what we found, right, is, is in, 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 and I know you've heard this term, right, situations in which schools have increasingly become technology rich, but, but curriculum poor. Hmm. And so even as schools are now striving to figure out how to provide hotspots, how to provide, um, you know, broadband access, how to provide computers uh, to, to kids who are having to learn outside of school now, um, let's say at some point, right, that issue gets gets addressed relatively uh, effectively, right? Or, or to a sufficient degree, where kids are no longer denied access simply because denied access to participating in remote learning, literally because they don't have the hardware or the broadband access, connectivity access to participate. So let's say we deal with that, right? That That's at best what we would describe as 50% of the, of, of the problem. Yeah. The, the other side of that, right? You know, 50% or maybe even more is the curriculum, right? That is to say, now, what are we asking kids to do with that technology, right? How are we asking them or expecting them to demonstrate understanding, comprehension, mastery, right? The ability to, to sort of excel uh, and develop academically in the ways that, that, that we think we want them to. And I think that's right become the, the fundamental challenge here uh, when we talk about digital equity. It's really a, a larger question about social and educational in, um, inequality uh, and the degree to which kids still, even in technology rich environments, not to mention, right, technology poor environments, uh, that more, more and more kids, particularly those who are, who are coming up right in lower income circumstances, minoritized youth, for example, that they are still just disproportionately more likely to grow up in schools where the curriculum is either uh, insufficient uh, in terms of creating opportunities for kids to learn STEM. So the other thing, Justin, that we learned, right, is that Black and Latinx kids don't lack STEM aspirations. Mm -hmm. They want to, to, to thrive in, in STEM. They have STEM aspirations. They're, they're, there are STEM pathways that they're interested in pursuing. And they're using technology recreationally all the time. They're being creative all the time. They're, yeah. Absolutely. They're all the time. A absolutely. So, 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 they, so it's not a, a, a lack of, of interest, aspiration, and motivation. It, it really is, I think, a, a lack of, of, of opportunity, right? And so, so I think that, and that problem is going to continue and maybe even become exacerbated as learning becomes more, more remote, more hybrid, right? As a result of whatever the world looks like post COVID. Um, you know, the, the question still becomes, how do we design 
rich and relevant pathways for kids to develop the kinds of competencies, the kinds of skills that they'll need in, in, a, in a knowledge driven world, in a knowledge driven economy, and in a, a sort of a civic world uh, in which uh, engagement and participation in civic life require fundamentally different kinds of skills today, right? How do you identify, you know, uh, deep fake videos? Uh, how do you navigate, right, the sort of massive, sort of deliberately designed, um, you know, disinformation campaigns that are intended to, um, uh, to, to, to invite people to, 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 disin to, dis to be disinclined to participate uh, in, the, uh, in the democratic process, right, in, in elections or things of this nature? Um, how do we help young people understand what it means now to live in a datafied society, right, in which virtually every aspect of our lives is now data-driven, a uh, data influence. And so these are the kinds of questions that I think are becoming more and more important. And yet, how do we create opportunities, pathways for kids to be able to develop the kind of critical skills, awareness, and capacity to exercise agency in a world like this? And it sounds like one answer you have to that question is to say, look at the practices that the kids are already doing. Um, you know, look at the look at the creative work, look at the interest driven work that they're already doing, you know, after the bell rings and figure out more ways of linking that back into the classroom and into the curriculum. Is that a fair summary of one pathway for this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it certainly isn't 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 the only way. Right. But but I think, you know, as we as we as a society, right, and as educators begin to develop a more nuanced understanding of, of the power of education, the power of designing for equity in education. You know, I think there's a there's a growing recognition that that we're not only doing this, you know, for our students, right, on their behalf, but if we can also get to the point where we're we're do, doing at least part of this work with them, right, where they are sort of co-designers of what the learning experience might look like, or at least they offer some some perspective, some expertise, right, some experience that we can tap into leverage or, or, or further facilitate that can really enrich the learning environment, right? So, and that's something that we learned in our work, right? Is that for a lot of young people that we were, that we got to know in the research that we were doing, is that for many of them, right, the, the major sort of um, appeal to coming to school was at the end of the day, they knew that they would have access, right, to computers, access to software, access to, to spaces, access to different forms of capital, digital capital, social capital with their peers and teachers that allowed them right, to pursue right, those sort of creative aspirations that they have with technology, making film, making music, making videos, making, making simple video games, designing all kinds of interesting content and, and, and digital artifacts. Um, you know, that was what, 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 what compelled them to come to school um, even though for many of them, right, school was, 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 let's just be honest, right, it wasn't the most interesting place for them, right? It didn't inspire them. Um, it didn't really create those pathways for them to realize their potential and their capacity for agency uh, and, 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 and influence. And rather, it was what they were able to do in those more informal settings and situations that was really the appeal so, so how can you how can you take that energy, right, that that sort of informal out of school provides them with, sort of somewhere or another, figure out a way to bring that into the formal setting, um, and you 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 have a very different situation, right? You have a very different environment, which unleashes unleashes rather um, just amazing and rich potential for kids to begin to start realizing uh, their 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 capacity, right, to to have voice their capacity to think and about and solve problems. Um, and so we, we began to, to try to, to think about schools, right, as, as, as laboratories, as innovation labs, uh, as spaces that if you could operate in these ways, right, they would be much more engaging, quite frankly, much more relevant and meaningful for students. And it sounds like conceivably, you know, even if you couldn't fix everything that happened all day in school, you could start with the question of in the periphery of the curriculum, how do we make more spaces for these labs to be able to exist? Like, OK, you know, maybe we can't fix, you know, this like highly standardized part of the curriculum. But there's a lot, you know, there's lots of untested subjects. There's lots of electives. There's lots of space in our schools for doing these things. You know, it sounds like, you know, a kind of double whammy of the pandemic that I could imagine seeing from your perspective is one, um, you know, there's been a huge narrative around learning loss. 
this idea that like, because kids missed a bunch of school, um, they're now behind relative to where they were supposed to be. And then as a result of that, we have to kind of focus more on the core curriculum and focus on the things um, that, uh, that they missed. But it, but it sounds like from your line, like a, a thing we could take from your line of thinking is like, well, actually, maybe what we need is to celebrate all the learning that young people have been doing over the last nine months. Not all of it may be what we planned, um, but they've developed a lot of new technology skills, a lot of new communication skills, a lot of skills around independent self-directed learning. Um, and we need to build on and draw from that. And, um, you know, we were doing some focus groups this summer with educators and there was one assistant superintendent who said, I don't, I don't know how much we're going to be able to get kids in the building this fall, but we want half their time devoted to electives and extracurricular activities. Um, we want half the time devoted to the stuff that kids love most about schools when they're here in the building. Um, but I don't know that that's been a common um, perspective to take right now. You know, I think there's a lot more like, well, how do we make sure that we get the double math in? Um, and uh, but but it, but it sounds like you know your your research surfaces a whole bunch of stories from young people that that points to the ways that that their interests um, and their resilience and their entrepreneurship can really be a source of inspiration for educators in schools. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I think you're right, right? It's, it's you know, that sort of double down sort of model that you've just referred to. It's almost like, you know, education as as as, as bad medicine, right? Just trying to force it onto kids and yeah. you take this because you'll feel better. You know, it may, it may taste horrible, but you'll you'll feel better in the long run. And, and We didn't eat nearly enough broccoli last spring, so we really need to feed you some broccoli this fall. We're, we're doubling up on the broccoli, you know. <laughs> Exactly. Um, you know, your, um, your, your comments remind me of something that I saw kind of early on in the pandemic. And I think it was, so it was as the outbreak was beginning to spread across New York City, for example. And I think um, one of the suburbs of New York, New Rochelle, right, was where there was where, where some initial outbreaks that, that began to start happening there. And soon thereafter, New York kind of be, became the sort of temporary epicenter of the coronavirus here in the U.S. Um, there was some interesting reporting about um, high school students in New Rochelle and how they essentially created an Instagram channel in order to start providing uh, the community at large, but, but more specifically, right, their peers, news and information about the virus, right? Um, news and information that they thought was relevant to them, uh, news and information um, that better informed them about what was happening with the pandemic, and I thought it was just right a, 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 a wonderful kind of illustration of, of what we're talking about here. Um, kids using, um, in this case, right, social media as a platform for facilitating a civic conversation around the pandemic uh, as a way of trying to assert greater agency over the quality of the information that was flowing within their community about the pandemic. But I mean, think about that, right? I mean, just, I mean, so so what they were doing there, just sort of independently, sort of organically, sort of create, you know, creatively, there, there are all kinds of academic implications in, in that, right? Communication, yeah. um, you know, a civic engagement, um, you know, health. Science journalism. Right, exactly. Um, and so it was, it, so it's just one indicator of the, of the ways in which, you know, those kinds of skills, those kinds of, you know, creative applications of technology I mean, can, can inform, right, how, how educators, you know, might begin to sort of rethink what education should look like, what learning might look like when it's more experiential, when it's more relevant, uh, when kids are able to exercise greater agency and creativity in what that looks like. Um, and so, um, you know, it doesn't always have to be so, um, so me mechanical, so top down, um, you know, overly, um, you know, um, you know, scholastic, and, and this is someone who's who's a scholar, right, uh, mm -hmm. saying this. But but the idea, right, is is that is that academic development, right, can can happen in so many forms and fashion. Um, and um, and I think you know, I think young people, in some ways, at least, give us some insight, right, some indication of what that might look like. And and and, and clearly, I'm not advocating right that they have all the answers and that we should turn over the, the entire curriculum development to them. But 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 we have something to learn from how they're learning with and designing technology to matter in their lives. 
Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That if that and it's, and over and over again, I certainly feel like I've learned that if you ask students to, if you promise students that you'll take their ideas seriously, they will give you serious ideas that contribute to what you're building. Well, Craig Watkins, we should be reading The Digital Edge. We should be reading Don't Knock the Hustle. Do you have anything else that's recently out or coming up soon that we should know about? Um, yeah, you know, we, we, uh, so my, some of my colleagues in the, in the connected learning uh, research network, um, out of which both the digital edge and don't like the hustle emerge out of, um, uh, we wrote a, we, we wrote a, another book. So there were sort of three books that I helped produce that sort of came out of all of that, that research that we did with the network, but it's really about uh, young people's transition into the, the creative economy. And I, I think that's the title of the book actually. Um, but it's, it's just another example of, of how we might think about education, how we might think about the future of learning uh, by looking at the ways in which young people are sort of navigating and finding their, their pathways into the more creative sides of our sort of economic order today. Well, we'll get links to all three of those books in our show notes. Um, Craig Watkins, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Justin, and uh, congratulations on the book, and uh, I wish you uh, continued success. Thanks. That was Craig Watkins. He's the author of The Digital Edge and Don't Knock the Hustle, and he's a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I often turn to Craig's work as a reminder of the creativity and entrepreneurship and resilience of young people. And I think as we face the pandemic and all that young people have lost during this time, Craig's voice is an important reminder to me, I hope an important reminder to you, to recognize how much youth are creating and surviving and thriving in their own ways during these periods too. And we have a lot to learn from them and we have a lot to gain from partnering them. Um, we'll put links to all of Craig's books in the show notes. And as always, we'll put a link to my own new book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education, out from Harvard University Press, which you can find at failuretodisrupt.com. I'm Justin Reich. Thanks for listening to Teach Lab. Please subscribe to Teach Lab to get future episodes on how educators from all walks of life are tackling distance learning during COVID-19. If you're so inclined, visit your favorite podcast site, give us a rating, and leave us a review. This episode of Teach Lab was produced by Amy Corrigan and Garrett Beasley, recorded in sound mix by Garrett Beasley. Stay safe until next time.